Yeah. Can I start, Robbie, before we get going? I, I just want to take, um, you know, kind of a minute to, to thank our staff, um, our scouting staff, our coaching staff, um, our trainers, um, everybody that's, you know, had input into the process, you know, leading us up to, to this weekend. You know, uh, Ryan Cowden, our VP of player personnel, uh, Monty Austin Ford, our director of player personnel, John Salgi, our college director, um, have all been instrumental in, in, in this draft process. Uh, Patrick Wu um, has done an outstanding job of scheduling these meetings. Um, our, our college scouting coordinator uh, with these Zoom prospects. So just a, a tip of the cap to, to everybody that's um, had, a, had a pretty important, a very important hand uh, in this process so far. Tim, go ahead. Okay, John, uh, I, I guess how has the draft prep been this year compared to last year when you had a combine, but then everything was kind of adjusted on the fly? What was it like this year where you kind of knew the parameters coming in, but you still had a lot of restrictions? Yeah, I think that, um, you know, having the pro days uh, this year, Jim, was was beneficial being able to, to go to the college campuses, uh, see these uh, guys perform um you know athletically on the field see them interacting uh, with their teammates have some you know face-to-face -face interactions with you know with some coaches and staff members at the various universities was what was different that was it was really good um I felt like that the I felt like the zoom meetings um you know it's been a little over a year now that we've been in this zoom world um the the players were a little bit more comfortable on there um, they were used to it. It wasn't something that, you know, that was new to them. Um, you know, the medical has still been a little challenging, you know, because you're not, uh, we got 150, I think it was this year, roughly there, that number, um, that actually went to Indy and, and we were able to you know, get a medical on those guys. So still working through all the information on, on that, but it's typically you get, I don't know, 300, 350 prospects where you're able to get a medical grade on. So, um, you know, Todd and his staff, the doctors have all uh, been working hard to, to, to fill in any uh, cracks that may be there you know, with the medical information. Uh, Teron? Yeah, good morning, John. Uh, looking at the uh, offensive line and also the defensive line, when you look at these prospects and how it is within this group, is there a serious drop off when you go from that first tier to the second tier? Would you consider that more than that receiver and corner? Yeah, morning, TD. Thanks for the question. Yeah, I think that I think the offensive line group probably has a little bit more depth, uh, top to bottom, maybe than than the D line group. Um, you know, there's a, there's some good players in in the defensive line group, but I feel like the volume, um, the supply of players that you know that's in that offensive line group, um, you know, maybe a little bit deeper uh, than the defensive line group this year. Thank you, uh, Teresa. John, you mentioned uh, the medicals. Uh, that recheck uh, maybe helped clear up some of those uh, outstanding questions, or was it just maybe simple, un simply a numbers thing, only getting so many rechecked uh, uh, once again? Yeah, I think that, <clears throat> you know, Todd, um, I've got a ton of respect for, for Todd Torcelli, and, and he's a, a very well-respected uh, trainer in, in the football world uh, across campuses and, and universities. Uh, but yeah, we're still gathering information. Him and his team are circling back with teams, you know, the, the, the trainers and the medical staffs at some of these you know, colleges to, to make sure that we've got the, as much and as accurate as information uh, as possible. Uh, but that recheck, yeah, follow up information on those guys with, with any information that might have, you know, either clear up a player or, you know, maybe confirm a concern uh, about a player. Uh, all, all of those medical things are extremely important. Uh, John, <clears throat> John, I know uh, with your draft day deals over the years, you, it looks like you've been more inclined to, to move up a lot of times and you have moved back. Um, I guess wondering why do you think that is and, and what kind of confidence do you have to have in your you know, evaluation of a specific player to, to move up and go after a guy? Yeah, I think that's a um, – anytime you're going to move up, you know, there's you've kind of got your – your eyes on, on on maybe one player or two players and you know according to how many picks you are away from that player or you might get some information that hey this team you know they might they might jump you or they're looking to come up too um and you're trying to put yourself in a position 
uh, to get the guy you want. Um, I think that, you know, we're kind of talking through that this morning um, and we'll continue to talk through it this week or who are those guys that if we get within striking distance and then what's the cost of that? Because you're going to have to give something up uh, to, to move up uh, versus uh, are there four or five, six players, three players, how many players do you have, you know, left on, on, on the draft board up there where you would consider it 22? How far can you go back? and still get one of those guys um, and maybe pick up another pick. Yep, Robbie, I hope this is a natural follow on this <laughs> one. But, uh, um, yeah, you speaking of, of this year, uh, at 22, it seems like that's a spot where a lot of teams will move back. Uh, um, you know, do you think it's any more likely that you might do it, move back this year than, than other years? Yeah, I think that's something that we'll certainly talk about. Um, if if that presents itself and it, and it, and it you know, it allows us to, you know, look at the board and there's still players that we think we can get three, four, five, six picks back and pick up an extra pick. We'd certainly entertain that. Um, but, you know, you don't want to you don't want to trade back just to, to trade back. You know, there's got to be kind of a, um, you know, what's the what's the return on, on on that move? And can you still get a player that you want um, and maybe pick up a pick in, in doing so? Thanks, uh, Emily. <clears throat> John, I'm curious just kind of how you balance your draft preparation with day of like draft gut feelings. You know, when you're drafting, is it strictly based on the rankings that you have and the board that you've put together? Or do you sometimes go off script and, and go off a of feeling in the moment? Um, great question. I think that we <clears throat> we've done a lot of work on on these these guys. Um and and, and we've watched uh, them in in pods, and we've we've looked at the the vertical stacking of players, uh, coupled with the horizontal you know stacking of players positionally. Um, talk through different scenarios, um, and, and have a really good feel about about where where we're at in our, in our rankings. And um, at, at the end of the day, you, you you've got to trust your instincts and all the information that you have on the player. And uh, if there's two players. Uh, that are that are side by side, but different positions. Um, I, I tend to go with with my gut and um, and pick the player who I think can help the team the most. Uh, Buck, hey John, you guys haven't uh, you guys haven't drafted a class larger than six players since 2017 <laughs> when you're in your first couple of years here when you were having to basically restock the roster. How how similar is is this draft to back when you first got to Tennessee? given what the financials have done to, to everyone's roster construction? Yeah, I think any, you know, especially with the, um, you know, with the salary cap going down, the, the I say it all the time, the the draft class and this rookie class of, of, of player uh, every year, it's it's a younger, less expensive uh, player than, you know, you're going to go after in, in free agency. Um, so the ability for those guys to, um, you know, bolster the roster uh, and the more picks the, uh, means the more chances you have it, you know, at, at hitting him on one of those guys. I'm excited about the number of picks that we have this year and, you know, whether we come away with fewer picks if we move up or, or more picks if we move back, we'll just kind of see how that goes. But it's an important part uh, of the team building process. Uh, Paul. Hey, John, you guys have been uh, pretty patient uh, even with with first rounders in terms of your ask John gotcha yeah, that, that was me yeah. Sorry. you guys have been pretty patient of your ask of guys early even first rounders uh, given the roster holes this time around you're gonna need to expect more of this rookie class sooner I think as soon as those guys can can contribute, um, the sooner the certainly the, the sooner the better. And, and we've had guys that, um, you know, maybe it's it's been injuries, uh, been some dings, some bumps and bruises, um, and some a little bit more serious, like Jeffrey's situation where he was coming off that knee. It took him a little while to get going, um, but them acclimate the quicker they can acclimate themselves to our program. Uh, and, and the pro game, pro game, the, the better. Um, and yeah, we want, we want all of these guys, you know, whether it's the first rounder, the, you know, wherever they're drafted, the quicker they can contribute and help the football team, uh, the better. Uh, David Bocar. 
John, is, is four picks in the top 100 a, a big number, a, a good number? How do you look at that? What's your opportunity here the first two days of this draft? Wish I had more than four. Um, but that's that's what that's what we've got. We'll see what we can make out of that. You know, can we turn can we turn four into into five or, or maybe six? I think, you know, I've got some calls to put in this week around the league with other GMs just to um, kind of gauge their willingness uh, to, to move around, um, you know, Thursday night and Friday night. Um, and we'll see how that, you know, those calls go this week. But uh, I think everybody, you know, kind of knows that, that we're willing to kind of shuffle around. We have, you know, historically been a team that doesn't mind shuffling around uh, pick-wise. Uh, Tara? John, how do you go about and how is the process different in vetting the opt-out guys who don't have any, film from 2020 and haven't been in that structured college environment as you go to assess them yeah I felt like you know between our you know our our, our scouts um our, our coaches um on these zoom calls um uh, myself coach Vrabel um the the you know the directors um and at the upper level you know in, in our scouting department um being on these calls um getting to know the, you know, kind of the, the, the reason behind it, you know, what was, and there's a lot of different circumstances that the players uh, went through um, hearing them out and, and trying to understand what went behind their decision um, and getting to know them as, as, you know, as people and, and understanding that a, you know, a lot of them had family situations that they were concerned about, but um, you know, a, a lot of those guys went back to their, to their pro days and, and performed uh, well and uh, seeing them move around athletically um, and, and talking to their staffs and, and getting the reasoning behind um, their decisions not to play this fall um, was all was good, you know, and we, we, we continue to, we've got a few more Zoom calls this week uh, with guys and um, just trying to clean up the board. Gentry? Yeah, John, um, you know, how, how are you kind of viewing, you know, need at positions versus best player when it comes to to the first round this year, you know, obviously you've got some positions where you're probably looking to add some guys early on. I mean, are you looking and saying, Hey, we, we need to have this done by this time. Um, yeah, I think that if, it, if you can get it to match up Gentry in a perfect world, that's um, where need meets the best player on the board, then that's a, you know, that's kind of a perfect world, but you're going to need um you're going to need really, you're going to need good football players at some point, you know, and just because, you know, we may not have a glaring need at a position doesn't mean that we wouldn't take a player there. Uh, if we think that the impact that he could have uh, on the team uh, at some point this year, you, you can't predict injuries, you know, knock on wood, we don't, we don't have a bunch this year, but you, you just, you just don't know. Um, so having, having good players that can, that can go in the game, and play at a winning level at, at any position, um, it, it's important. Uh, Jared? Yeah, John, when it comes to replacing uh, Janu, and it, it, you look at blocking tight ends versus receiving tight ends, do you kind of say with a 2,000 yard rushing attack that you guys have, you'd rather prefer the block here or? maybe more of a receiver to replace that production in the past game. How do you weigh those knowing that you're not going to be able to get probably the best tight end in this class, uh, but maybe another tight end after that? Yeah, I think it's a good question. I, I think that, um, you know, we, we evaluate the skill sets of the players and, and, and what they, what can they do and maybe some areas that they need to improve on. Um, they're going to have to block at some point, even the, you know, the, the quote unquote receiving tight ends. Um, at a minimum, if they can just get in the way uh, long enough uh, for the back to get by them. Um, so they're, they're going to have to have some degree uh, of blocking ability. Certainly some of these players and, you know, and not just in this draft, in any draft, um, the strengths may be more receiving than, than blocking. But, you know, we think there's there's players in this draft that, that can do both. Um, some need to improve. Um, you know, maybe in the in the blocking component, some need to improve in the receiving component. I wouldn't say we err one way or the other because I think you you can't just pigeonhole yourself into this guy as a you know blocking tight end because then you know sub you know, they're going to sub out 
um, defensively and, and stack the box. So th there's got to be somewhat of a receiving component to the tight end position. Uh, Joe Retro. Yeah, John, just wondering how you evaluate the depth in this draft at receiver and cornerback. Um, I guess in particular at cornerback, is there a huge drop off from the first, you know, few guys to the next tier or however you, whatever you call it. And then also, um, how did that influence the way you went about free agency? So I just got three in there for one for you there. The old three for one special, Joe. Um, no, I'll start with the receiver, uh, receiver group. I think that, you know, that group there's, there's, you know, there's, it's pretty, it's pretty balanced uh, from, from top to bottom. You know, you certainly have, uh, some premium players at, at the top, uh, and then uh, you know it, it's there's good depth players and, and role players, um, really all all throughout the draft. I think the corner group um, there's some there's some good players at the top and kind of in the middle, and then you know at the back side in the back you're you're kind of drafting some some traits. There's some guys that are really fast at the back end. There's some guys that are, are really good tacklers. It's really kind of, you know, what you want for your football team, to what degree can they play in the kicking game. Uh, it's important for that position. So uh, I think both position groups have pretty good volume. Uh, the receivers are maybe a little more evenly spread, um, let's say value-wise, maybe more so than the corners. Ben from Tennessee. Hey, hey, uh, John, um, you know, just entering your sixth draft as, you know, GM of the Titans, how how would you kind of assess the overall job that you, your personnel team, has done in building up the Titans the last five five drafts from where this franchise was when you took over? It's that kind of a big question. but um, Yeah, I think, I mean, at the end of the day, it, it, it's, it's about wins and, and losses. Um, you know, I don't really – you know, look at the draft grades or what's my cumulative draft grade. I don't even know what that would be. Um, but we try to get guys um, and we haven't been perfect. You know, we've certainly had, you know, some misses along the way, but guys that come in and, and buy into our philosophy and, and, and what we're trying to do here and, and contribute on the field to, to winning. Um, and we've, we've won more, you know, than we've lost. We'd certainly would like to win some more. You know, there's some games that, that we didn't win that, you know, we, we, we would like to win. Um, but I'm, I'm proud of the work that's been put in by our scouts um, and, and the way that we go about evaluating prospects and, and how, we, how they fit our football team. Uh, again, we haven't been perfect, um, but I feel like we've, you know, we're, we're, we're certainly, on, certainly on the right track. Excuse me. Uh, Tatum? Hey John, I know last year you guys had a pretty uh, incredible setup at home for the for the draft, and now you guys can kind of be together in one room. What will it be like to be able to make those decisions back together again? But also, you know, we saw LA; they had like a McMansion going on over there too. So, you know, I mean, do you guys have a special setup for this week? Uh, we don't. We do not have a McMansion. Um, you know, me and me and Coach Rabel may pitch a tent out beside the lake. Um, and, and we don't have a ram that we can – maybe there's a, a raccoon or something we could kind of let rummage in there with us um, as we pick. Uh, I'm just kidding. Um, we're, we're, you know, with the, with the building um, being renovated, we've relocated um, to another spot. We've got a, basically a, a draft room set up that's exactly the same uh, as our typical draft room except smaller. Um, but to be back in in the office and and having you know we've met every day for the last uh, three or four weeks just watching and 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 going through these prospects and watching them back to back and having discussions and and, and talking to um, our security team about prospects our player engagement and and Mitch about prospects our coaches but having those face to face interactions and. Uh, discussions about these guys has been uh, great. It's more normal, um, and, and I'm excited uh, for, for draft weekend and and to be back in the draft room, you know, with our guys looking at the board and um, much more what I'm used to than what we did last year. Uh, Luke? John, you've historically uh, valued production pretty highly in the players you've drafted, but when you have guys who 
maybe only played five games this past year due to COVID cancellations or like Terry asked earlier, opted out. How do you handle uh, the limited sample size? And, and what is your sort of view on going back to maybe 2019, 2018 tape on some guys? Yeah, Luke, we've definitely done that. You know, we've gone back and, and watched uh, some of the 19, a lot of the 19 stuff on these guys. A um, couple guys, we've watched every game from the 19 season that they played in. Um, and, and I think that's important. And, and, and production is important. We want guys to come in and, and, and produce. And, you, you know, the, the, the key is how does that translate from the college game to the pro game? Um, some guys it happens quickly. Some guys it might take them a little a little longer. So, um, yeah. But going back and looking at what they, you know, how did they perform in maybe a, a more normal setting uh, in the 2019 season? Uh, we've watched some 2019 games on guys that didn't opt out that actually played in 2020 just to see if um, what did what did that look like? You're trying to get a broad spectrum um, exposure wise on on these guys. Uh, Steve. Hey, John, I've seen some kind of conflicting reports and you always take these with a grain of salt because theoretically they came from someone's front office, but how deep the first round is. And I've seen some people say there's as low as maybe like 15 or 16 first round grades out. And then others have said otherwise, where are you guys in that? Do you think this is a typical first round? Is it, is it more, is it less stacked up front? And then, uh, I guess the follow on that, is there any other, you talked corner and, and wide receiver, are there any other positions that particularly stand out because of their depth and quality? Yeah, I mean, I think if you polled, you know, 32 teams, they would have different numbers of guys that are, are quote unquote uh, first round graded players. Um, you know, I'm not going to get into the specifics of, of, you know, where those guys are, are graded for us because, um, you know, one first rounder for one team may not be a first rounder for another team. Um, but I think, it, we're, you know, we're tr we, we try to look and see as the guy um, to what degree is he going to come in? Is he going to be an impact player? Is he going to come in um, and, and, and be a, a role starter or a starter? Is he going to be a backup? Um, you know, where, where does that fall? Um, I think the, to the second part of your question, the offensive line group, I think as a whole, you know, both tackle and, and interior guys, I think there's pretty good depth at that position um, really all throughout the draft. I think there's, you know, there's guys, I'd say that position, not to compare, it's probably closer to, you know, maybe the, maybe the receiver position where you, know, you have a, a pretty good pool of players um, that you think you can get in, and will ha have a role on the team um, top to bottom. And I got a number of uh, follow-ups if we could roll through some of those. Um, Toronto? Yeah, John, traditionally the slot receiver, like that's not something that you guys would draft in the first round. But given how this game has expanded to so much operating in space and those type of things, how has your viewpoint of a slot receiver in the first round as a possibility? How has that changed? Um, you know, I think that, you know, you got to define the role for the for the player. Okay, to what degree can he also play on, on the outside tee? Um, does he give you anything in the kicking game? Uh, maybe as a returner, um, what's the what? How does he change the game? Um, is it a is it a speed uh, component? Is it a get open component? Some guys get open. You know, I've had this discussion before about um, with the slot receivers. Some there's some speed slots. There there's you know down the field vertical guys, uh, and then there's some some shifty make you miss kind of guys. And the guys that can do both, um, you know, probably have a maybe have a little bit more value. Um, and I think that. At the end of the day, for the at the receiver position, you know, we tell all these guys, and we've said it for you know six years now, uh, get open, catch, and block. You know, those are the three most important things for the receiver position. And there's some certainly uh, some inside receivers, some slot receivers uh, that fit that bill this year. Uh, Corey Curtis. Hey, John. Um, you've drafted two right tackles in round one since you got here but we're able to plug in Dennis the last two years and, and really not miss a beat offensively. Does that make you reassess the need to, to, to use that kind of value at that position? Um, you know, I think that, you know, we look at, there's some, certainly some players that at the tackle position that are, that are, are, are worthy um, of first round picks. Um, you know, we'll just kind of see how, how it goes, how those guys come off the board. 
and that's that horizontal component that I was alluding to, you know, is it, is there a, you know, is there a linebacker or a pass rusher or a corner, any position? Uh, how do you have those guys stacked up versus the other position uh, when it comes to your time on the clock? Uh, David Beauclerc. John, how unusual is this draft in terms of the number of quarterbacks who are likely to go in the first round? And, and what does that do for a team like you sitting there at number 22? Um, yeah, I mean, I think that anytime you're, you know, you're not maybe in that, in that world, um, where you're, where you're looking to take a, a, a cue that high, um, that that pushes another player at another position down to you. Uh, so, um, you know, I've all, we've, we've evaluated those guys just like, you know, every other team and, um, ranked them accordingly. Um, but, uh, hopefully, hopefully it pushes down a couple players that, you know, maybe if, the, if that wasn't such a hot commodity uh, this year, it seems, um, pushes a player to you that maybe typically wouldn't be, th be there for you. Uh, yeah. And John, you talk about the importance of pro days this year. How many did you end up going to? Is that more than maybe usual? And in a year when you don't have a, you know, much in-person contact with these players, how could that help break a tie for you or how valuable could that in-person contact be? Yeah, it, it was great for me, Jim, to, to, to get back out and, and get on some, some campuses and, and watch these guys uh, work uh, live, um, visit with some of the staff there, um, you know, participate in some of the drills with some of the guys. Um, all, all of that was really good for me. Um, I don't know exactly how many I went to, maybe 10 or 12, uh, something like that. It's, that may be about normal. Um, I've done some more private, you couldn't do private workouts this year, but I've done more, you know, kind of some private workouts uh, in years past uh, that we couldn't do this year, but the pro days were certainly good uh, to kind of get back in that world. Uh, Paul? John, um, want to get this correct. Is it is uh, have there been scenarios where during some of the checks, medical checks in Indianapolis, your medical people haven't necessarily been involved and you're taking the medical information from a group of team doctors that didn't include yours? Yeah, I think that there was a pool of doctors um, that, you know, kind of combined the information. Again, I wasn't there. I don't know exactly how all that went down. Um, but there, our doctors jumped around to, to some different rooms uh, to, to visit with some guys specifically um, and, and came away um, and dealt with the situation as best as possible um, to get a grade on the guys and, and have a good feeling when we had our medical meeting about where we were. But if you wanted to see player X, you might not have been able to see player X. I think that's accurate, Paul. Thank you. Uh, Jared? Yeah, John, when it comes to the uh, situation last year with Isaiah, you talked about wanting to kind of, um, you know, look back on the process. Similar with Kevin Dodd, you said that you wanted to see how you could improve from that. Are there any thoughts uh, on last year, how that played out, and maybe things that you guys improved on, especially being in a second year of a virtual setting? Yeah, I, 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 I kind of touched on it earlier. We, you know, we we were pretty exhaustive on our, I don't have the exact number of, of Zoom calls, but we had different people um, within that hour uh, session that we could have, um, touch touch these guys and have interactions with them. Um, you know, and, and as guys got more comfortable, I know I I personally was on on a lot with Coach with Coach Vrabel and, and getting to know these guys and spending time with them um, for, you know, 30, 45 minutes, sometimes the full hour. Um, but having different people interact with it and then come back and collectively go over uh, what we were able to glean from those conversations and, and see areas and players that, you know, maybe they're – there is still some concern or, you know, we're going to have to have a plan for this specific players. And, you know, these players, other players were great, would be a great addition to the team, no issues. Um, having those opinions of various people without within the organization um, was much, I felt more expansive this year and closer to what we would normally do 
um, in a non-virtual world. All right, still got a handful more. Uh, ben from Tennessee. Yeah, John, you, you just kind of addressed the Isaiah uh, Wilson thing, but just kind of a follow up on that, you know, uh, previous question, um, just with what happened there. Um, what if any ad additional internal pressure like pressure you put on yourself? Um, or what pressure do you put on yourself to kind of do to hit on this year's draft after you know what happened there? Is there any additional pressure going into this year? Or, do you, or is it kind of like the same? Um, uh, you know, amount of pressure just in, in any draft, if, if that kind of makes sense. No, I think I've spoken nauseam about that situation last year, Ben. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that I always put pressure on myself to, to get it right. And, um, you know, I've, we've, we've gotten it probably right more than, than, than we have wrong. Um, but, you know, those last year was certainly a, um, it wasn't a great situation for us. And there's been, you know, maybe a, one other one that didn't work out so well, um, but I'm proud of the guys in the process uh, for the players that that have come in here and done things the right way and been productive members of our football team. And, and you can go down the list from, you know, from from Jack Conklin to AJ Brown to Kevin Byer to Derrick Henry to, I mean, rattle off all our draft picks. And there's been a lot of good ones, and and the ones that that I didn't get right or we didn't get right. Um, I'm certainly not looking to do that again. Thank you. Uh, Terry? John, how, what kind of value is there in this year's edge rusher group in the draft? Is it top heavy or are there there's some players that can help throughout, uh, especially if you are looking for situational pass rushers? Yeah, good question, Terry. I think that's a good position group. I think there's, there's certainly some guys, um, you know, at the top and then there's some guys kind of, uh, in the middle there that, that we like that we think can be uh, situation guys to, and, and maybe grow into, you know, to full time uh, starting into the line of scrimmage players. Um, and then there's some developmental guys, you know, that are going to be later on that, you know, we think have some upside as well. So, you know, I think that that's, some, that's a pretty good, that's a pretty good depth position as well. Uh, last three, uh, John. John, um, yeah, I guess arguably you guys have, uh, you know, needs at both the kind of the slot receiver and the nickel corner. I wonder when it comes to those positions, do you value how much they've played specifically at, at slots and nickel in college? Or is your philosophy more, you know, we get a, a really talented guy and we'll figure out who goes in the respective slot and, and, and nickel on both sides of the line? Yeah, I think it's probably the latter, John, you know, just trying to get, you know, a, a skilled player that, um, that has a skill set that, that we can maybe develop in there um, while providing some value, um, maybe at outside receiver, outside corner, whatever it may be. Um, and then, you know, work on, work on the intricacies um, of that position. Thanks. Uh, Joe, Rocho. Hey, John, on the tight end question, just wondering how you view Anthony Ferkser at this point, um, his progress as a blocker. Is he a guy who, can have a larger role in this offense and be more effective in the run game as well as the pass game? No, we're glad we got Ferk. I mean, um, you know, I can remember he was a, he was a rookie tryout guy um, and he's worked hard and, and he's improved and he's, he's gotten better. Um, he's a dependable target in the passing game. Um, he's competitive in, in the run game um, to get into a guy and stave him off. I think some of the positions that we put him in, you know, maybe detached, um, going to get that, you know, that, that nickel corner, or maybe it's a safety that's down. Um, that's a little different ask than if he's a wing or if he's on the end of the line of scrimmage trying to block a defensive lineman. Um, but I think he's a competitive guy. He works hard. He wants to be good at his craft. He's a team guy. Um, and, and I'm proud of the progress. And, you know, I'm, he's got some work to do, just like a lot of players on our team. But He's he's more than willing to do it. He's you know he's been working his tail off to get better. Uh, last one, Corey. Hey John, real quick, just uh, curious. Do you still go by the traditional Jimmy Johnson point chart? Do you have your own point chart, or does anything else go into trades for you? Yeah, Corey, that's that's kind of you know that's we're, we've gotten we've got three or four um, charts that you know that that we look look at. They're all kind of similar. There's a, maybe a 
a point here or a point there. Um, I think really you look at historical trades kind of more so maybe than the, the point chart, um, you know, because teams, teams maybe have their own chart and the, the point doesn't look you know, exactly like it, it should at the end of the day, if, if you want to move the pick or if you want to, you know, slide up or back, um, if typically, you know, sliding back five spots costs a, a third round in the first, you know, in the first round to slide back four or five spots, is that a third round pick? If that's what it's kind of historically been, then, you know, maybe you get a little fodder in there as a seventh or you're swapping sixes or something. Um, but the history of what's kind of gone is probably what you're going to lean maybe more so on than, oh, well, I'm short, you know, 2.7 points on, on the trade chart, so I'm not going to do it. Thanks, John.